Good morning. Today, Pastor Peter Chin will share the message from the book of Psalms, chapter 107, verses 1 through 9. I, Kyle, will be reading in English, and Rosette will be reading in Uganda. You can follow along on page 415 in the Pew Bibles in front of you or on the screen above. Kubanga okusasira kwe kwa luberera emirembe jonna abanunule ba mukama bogera bwe bati be yanunula mikono jo mulabe naba kunganya munsi nyinji mu buvanjuba ne mu bugwanjuba mu bukika bwa kono ne mu bwaddio be bachamira mudungu mu kubo omtali bantu ne batambula ekibuga che batulamu balumwa enjala ne nyonta Ememe yabwe nezilika mubo. Nebali okabakabila mukama munaku yabwe. Naba wonya mkwela likirila kwabwe. Era naba lunga nizibwa mkube goloko fu. Batu uka mchibuga chokutula mu. Kale singa wa ntubatendeleza mukama olobu lunjibwe. Na nebi ya magerobye eri ya bana baba ntu. Kubanga okuse meme e, Ego akuse meme egomba ne meme erumwe enyota ajijuze bilonje Give thanks to the Lord for he is good his love endures forever Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story those he redeemed from the hand of the foe those he gathered from the lands from east and west from north and south some wandered in desert wastelands finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. This is the word of the Lord. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, I wanted to start off by addressing um, a comment and a question that I've heard really repeatedly over the past couple of weeks, and that is, yes, I am growing out my hair. And <laughs> no, it wasn't on purpose. I just kind of forgot about it for a while, and here we are. Um, I haven't heard that much commentary on a Sunday for like a sermon or a political thing. <laughs> The most I've ever heard is for growing on my hair or wearing a sports jacket. So I don't know what that means about me. I don't know what it means about the church. It's just something for us to ponder. Um, we are heading into Thanksgiving week, and I thought it'd be good for us to reflect on Thanksgiving so we feel like we have some direction and some just kind of, uh, we're, we're thoughtful about this week as we head into it. And what I wanted to do is kind of illustrate the difference between how we usually approach and think about Thanksgiving normally in like a, an ordinary situation versus what we see in Scripture. And I think in commonly, like popularly, one way that we think about um, Thanksgiving is that it's a season to remember our blessings in order to inspire feelings of gratitude. Or what I would just say, it's a time to count our blessings, right? This week is a time where we list out all the good things that we have and the blessings, the relationships, the homes, whatever it might be. And that inspires this feeling of, oh, I am thankful. I am grateful for everything. And so that oftentimes is how we approach Thanksgiving. It's a time for us to count our blessings so that we can feel grateful. There's nothing wrong with that. I think that's a very powerful and effective way to give thanks. But what the Bible describes is actually very different from that very common practice, from that way we understand Thanksgiving. Because in the Bible, what we read in 1 Thessalonians 5, it says, give thanks in all circumstances. It doesn't say give thanks just for the good stuff or for the good list that you have. It says give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. So here we don't see a season, a week, where we give thanks. Instead, it's supposed to be something we're doing all the time. Very different from popular culture. And it's not just something we do when things are going well. That we say, here's my list of good things. I feel grateful. What Paul describes here is, things are not going well, and yet I still give thanks. So here we have very different understandings of Thanksgiving of this practice. 
right? We've got this season to think about good stuff and say, oh, I feel great. You've got this command in all seasons to be thankful, even in the very worst of times. So how do we make sense of that? How do we move from the common understanding of Thanksgiving of just feeling good because things are good to this other understanding where we give thanks no matter what the circumstances might be? I think Psalm 107 does a wonderful job in giving us an insight as to how we can legitimately do this without faking it, without just forgetting what's bad. There's actually a way we can give thanks in all circumstances. Psalm 107 begins um, with this common refrain that we find in the Psalms that lets us know it is a psalm of thanksgiving. It says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. So right away, we know that this is a psalm of thanksgiving. This is going to be about thanking God and being grateful for what we have and those kind of things. But what's interesting is what follows after this refrain. Usually in psalms of thanksgiving, it will go on to catalog what God has done. Forget not his benefits. Forget uh, not all the good things that he has given you. And that's oftentimes what we find, but not in Psalm 107. Psalm 107, after this first line, follows with four stories or vignettes. And it all begins with the same refrain. It says, some people did this and some experienced this. And so there are four stories that follow. And what's interesting about these stories is that they're actually pretty broken. These are not perfect stories. These are not heavenly stories about everything going well. The first story we read today is about exile. And it's about hunger. It's about not having enough to eat, where people don't have a home. It's referencing, really, the people of Israel in their wandering in the desert, but it's talking about not being in the wilderness and not having a place to be safe and not having enough to eat. And that's the reality. And God comes and, through a straight path, leads them to home. So that's the first story we read there. But it doesn't end there because it goes on. It says, Then some sat in darkness, in utter darkness, prisoners suffering in iron chains, because they rebelled against God's commands. So the second story is about being in prison, about suffering for the things that we have done wrong in utter darkness, in chains, and in captivity. That's the second story. And through that, God allows it, but ultimately he frees these people from their captivity. So that's the second story of Psalm 107, this Thanksgiving psalm. The third story is similar. It says, some became fools through their rebellious ways and suffered affliction because of their iniquities. Here it's not talking about captivity or imprisonment. It's talking about disease. It's talking about nearly dying because of physical affliction, suffering again for what we have done wrong. And these people are suffering terribly physically until God heals them. And then the fourth one really comes out of nowhere. It's about sailors. That's the fourth story because it says, Some went out to the sea in ships. They were merchants on the high waters. They saw the works of the Lord. And then it tells about how a tempest came and they rose on the waves and they went to the depths in the waves and they thought they were going to die until God, with a word, as he will later, calms that tempest. And so here, you have these very strange stories. You have a story about exile and homelessness. You have a story about imprisonment and darkness. You've got a third story about rebellious ways and sickness, cancer. We don't know what it is. And then a fourth story about people who almost die in a shipwreck. And those are the four stories of Thanksgiving in Psalm 107. And for all of us, it feels a little peculiar. Those aren't Thanksgiving stories. Thanksgiving stories is when this went well, this is awesome. These are different stories. But when you read this, they're very much Thanksgiving stories because it says before them, let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Right? Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell that story. Those he redeemed from the hands of the foe, those he gathered from the lands from east and west, from north and south. And after each story, it ends with the same refrain. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love. What Psalm 107 does, it demonstrates a very different approach to thanksgiving. It's not when we give thanks for the laundry list or for counting our blessings. It's not a bad thing. But it's illustrating a different form of thanksgiving where we don't give thanks just for individual blessings and moments and good things in our lives. but We give thanks for the story of our lives. 
Not for what God has done in one moment or in one circumstance, but how he has woven all those circumstances into a bigger narrative, into something that he is weaving in our lives. And we give thanks for that bigger and broader thing. Things that don't take place in a day, but over a decade instead. That we can give thanks for those things. And sometimes we get trapped, I think, in a very narrow understanding of this is good, this is good, this is good. But here Psalm 107 says you don't have to do that necessarily. You can say this was good, this was bad. This was hard. This was a blessing. This is a story for which I give thanks for. It's not the only time in Scripture that you will find people giving thanks for a story and not necessarily for the circumstances. Not that everything was perfect, but that they knew God was doing something bigger. And a perfect example of that is actually Advent or Christmas. When you think about the Advent story, there is a lot of worship. There's a lot of praise and thanksgiving. In fact, this Advent, we're going to be talking about worship and focusing on it. There's the Magnificat, which is Mary's hymn of praise, right? There is Zechariah's song that he will sing out. There is also the shepherds going to worship Jesus and the Magi, the angelic chorus. There is so much praise and thankfulness that's taking place in Advent, right? That marks those days, those years, But what's really interesting about that is that nothing is actually physically changed. Herod still rules the Israelites. He still taxes them. And in fact, he will kill every boy in the town of Bethlehem under the age of two. The Romans still occupy Israel. And in fact, in 70 AD, they will completely destroy the temple of God, the temple in Jerusalem. Jesus hasn't taught yet. He, as an infant, he wasn't like speaking in, in baby talk to everyone about the kingdom of God, revealing the kingdom and its upside-down nature. He hasn't died for sins. Sins are still unpaid for by the blood of Jesus. Nothing has changed at all. And yet there's all this worship that emerges from this time. What are they thanking God for? Nothing's changed. Mary makes it clear. She says, God has helped his servant Israel remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. She's thanking God, not just for what Jesus will do, but that this child indicates God's continuing his story. He's still here. After so many years of silence that preceded this time, God is still speaking. He's still writing our story. Our story continues. She's thankful because she knows God is still writing the story. Zechariah will say the same thing. He won't say, oh, everything's perfect. He will point to a story. God has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets long ago. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham. They are giving thanks for their story, for the story of God's faithfulness. Not necessarily because they understood what Jesus was going to do, not because Jesus had even done it yet, but because they knew God was writing this story still. And so this is a unique and often overlooked understanding of how we give thanks, not just for circumstance, not just for good things, but for the stories that our lives reflect. Why is that so powerful? Why is that different kind of thanksgiving such a powerful practice? A few ways that I want to talk about today. First, that I think being thankful for our stories allows us to be thankful even when our lives are far from perfect. Even when our lives are far from perfect. It's, it's hard to be grateful when things are, are at a worse point in our lives. It's just not natural. We all know that. Saying, oh, I'm really grateful that this is the worst season I've ever been in just does not click for us. And so it's so difficult to do what we read in 1 Thessalonians, give thanks in all circumstances. That's just not natural. But there is a way we can do it. If we know that those moments, even the worst, are part of something bigger. Right? The, The stories that are in Psalm 107 are not positive stories. If we had to modernize the language, the first one is about homelessness and starvation. That's what the psalmist describes. The second one is about being incarcerated. Maybe for what you did, but you live in solitary darkness and you're incarcerated. That's the second story. The third story is about cancer. It's about having brain cancer. It's about being terribly ill and you're looking death in the eye. That's the third story. The fourth story is about you were in a car crash and you might die. These are the stories of Thanksgiving. And again, We think, no, that can't be a story of thanksgiving. But the way that the psalmist is able to do that is that those moments are not the story. They are part of the story. 
They lead up to God's salvation, but they are not the whole story. There is a forest that we see, not just the trees. And give thanks for the entire story, which includes the low points. It includes the high points. And in fact, the low points illustrate how far God has brought us. One important thing, one way in which we can legitimately give thanks for hard things, if we know those hard things don't exist in isolation, but that God actually uses them. They're part of how God is doing something. They're part of a bigger story of redemption and restoration and teaching and discipline that God's using in our lives. Then we can legitimately say, that was not good, but God did something good in it, and so I thank God. We don't have to just put it to the side and say, I don't ever want to think or remember that time again. We can bring it out and say, I need to remember it because this is part of God's story for my life. And I praise God for it. Maybe an illustration of this is this Japanese art form, which is called kintsugi. Kintsugi is um, a form of pottery. And it's very interesting because usually when we think about priceless pottery, you make priceless pottery. You form it on the wheel so it's priceless, and that's what makes it so special is that it's perfect from the start. If you shatter a Ming vase, that's it. You've lost that preciousness. It's done. That's that's what pricelessness often means. It means perfection. But kintsugi is very different. With kintsugi, what they do is they take shattered pottery, and they use gold enamel glue to bring it back together into something new. And in that way, the cracks make it unique. No other piece of pottery will look like this ever again. The uniqueness and the beauty of this, how it is so different from everything else, is the cracks. The cracks make the new whole. It makes it what it is. It's beautiful because of what those cracks have formed. And so it is with us. We can give thanks for the hard moments if we know they're part of our story, they're part of what God has done. This is one of the rare ways in which we can legitimately give thanks in all circumstances if we know those circumstances are part of something bigger. The second reason that I think giving thanks for stories is so powerful that it reminds us that God is not just a giver of gifts, but the author of our stories. He's not just a giver of gifts, but the author of our stories. In James chapter 1, we hear a very well-known verse where it says, Every good and perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. It's a powerful illustration of God as a giver of every good gift you have in your life. God's hand is somehow, his fingerprints are somewhere on that gift that you've received. Powerful. Powerful understanding of God. But what we do problematically is we make God exclusively into the giver of good gifts. We say, God is identified by the good gifts that I have. That's what makes God who he is. And slowly and imperceptibly, God becomes dangerously close to another holiday figure, and that's Santa Claus. There's not all that much difference, right? Santa Claus is good because he gives me good gifts. God is also good in that way because he gives me good gifts. We get trapped in this perception that God's goodness is represented by all the good stuff that I have. The more good stuff that I have, the better God is. And slowly we just get caught in this perception of God. But in that exact same chapter in the book of James, James will write this. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that faith that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So in the same chapter where James says God is a giver of every good and perfect gift in your life, in the same chapter he will also say in every hard thing, God can also use. He'll use to make you more complete, to make you more mature, to accomplish things that you can't accomplish in any other single way. In other words, he's also the author of your story. He's the weaver of your tapestry. He's using all things, even the hardest things, to make you stronger, to make you more mature. And so here we see a more fuller understanding of God, not just the Santa Claus God who gives me all the good things. He's also the writer God, the author God, who is taking the hardest moments of your life and weaving it into just a chapter, the middle chapter that leads somewhere else, right? This is a better understanding of theological, the theological understanding of God. God's character is he doesn't dish out, you know, gifts to us. He's wise, he's mysterious, he's wild, writing stories and, and making, redeeming things in our lives. Being thankful for our stories is more in line with God's ways then. 
It divorces us from understanding God as this Santa Claus figure who's only there when things are good. And we begin to also realize he is this author figure who also uses the bad. It allows us to have this better, more accurate, and fuller understanding of God as the author of our stories and not just the giver of our gifts. The third reason why I love being thankful for stories is that stories help us to become thankful not just for God's gifts, but for God's presence. Like I just said, oftentimes our dominant understanding of God is through gifts, good stuff. And he's marked by that, identified by that. And usually it's jobs or, you know, house, health, things like that. But actually one of the best gifts, if not the best gift that he gives, is actually his presence. His presence. And those actually come in the worst times in our lives. And we see that gift, that promise in Psalm 23, that famous Psalm of David where it says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. Why? First off, does it say that we will never walk through the darkest valley? That one? That when we walk through the darkest valley, that means something went wrong, that God's not good or I wasn't good? No. It says you will. You will walk through the darkest valley, but you don't have to fear. Why? Because you're always going to come out on top? Because you're always going to survive every trial? Paul didn't survive every trial. He literally did not survive his trial. Then why are we so fearless? It's because of God's presence. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. We're not promised good situations. We're not promised a bulletproof life, but we are promised God's presence. Another time, Isaiah 43, he'll say this, when you pass through the waters, not if you pass through the waters, not that you never will pass through waters, but when you inevitably do, what's the promise? The promise is, I will be with you. The promise is God's presence. Not that we'll never see water, not that we'll never see fire, not that every person won't experience martyrdom, but that in all of those situations, he will be with us. And I think this is an important aspect of God's character we have to understand. God's goodness is not just marked by all the good blessings and the positive things on our balance sheet. God's goodness is also marked by his faithfulness to us, by his name, Emmanuel, in our lives. That's part of how we know God is good is that he's with us. Not that everything is awesome and we're always riding high. But even when we go down, God will always be right there with us. And being thankful for our stories clues us into that. Being thankful not just for the things that go on, but for our stories reminds us of that promise. It clues us into it. It gives us eyes to see it. That instead of just looking for the good stuff, we begin to see God's presence in all the different moments. It emerges kind of in focus for us. God was there with me here. He was with me in this hard time, miscarriage. He was here with me when my parents died. In this divorce, God was with me. But if we mark our lives by balance sheets, you never see that. All you see is absence. All you see is silence. All you see is God not being there. Knowing God, knowing our story, allows us to discern God's presence in our lives in every season. The last reason that that I identify, there's many more, but the last reason why I think stories, being thankful for stories is so powerful, is very practical. And that is stories make it much harder for us to compare our lives to one another. There is nothing so poisonous to the act of gratitude than jealousy. And I know this from my kids because I'll do something where I'll give one child uh, a dumb, dumb lollipop. Those are the small ones, right? And I'll give this child, you didn't have a lollipop before. I'm going to give you a lollipop. This is a lollipop you didn't have one second ago, right? If I do that, I give them a dumb, dumb lollipop. But then to another child in the same family, I give them a Tootsie Roll, which is the bigger kind with the Tootsie Roll inside or you know, the best of all is the one with the bubble gum. That's the one that everyone tries to hoard. I give that bigger one to the other child, the first child who has a lollipop. They did not have a second ago, right? They have something. They didn't have it a second ago, but now they've got something. They take one look at that bigger lollipop that their sibling has, and that lollipop vanishes. It just doesn't exist anymore. All they see is that lollipop. They don't even know about this lollipop. It's like, what the heck? Look at that lollipop. You, I've seen it a million times. That's why everything in our life, in our home, is equally sized. Every cup is the same size. Every piece of candy is the same size. Five of them are always the same size. Same room, same bed, everything. Because once something is slightly bigger, every, it's all, all it's just, ha- just havoc. It's chaos. I know that from my kids. 
that jealousy stole that lollipop from them, didn't it? Jealousy dematerialized a material blessing that was right in their hands. Of course, we do the exact same thing. We do the exact same thing. Nothing steals and kneecaps gratitude faster than when you compare your life to someone else. And if we mark our lives by our blessings, by the good stuff that's going on, by the pluses and minuses, by this list of good things, it's very easy to compare, isn't it? If we mark it by jobs, I can compare my job to yours. If we market it by marriages, I can mark, compare my marriage to yours. I can compare your child to mine, your house to mine, your income to mine. I can compare everything, and you can to me, if we just do it by that balance sheet of I wrote all of my blessings. It's rife, prepared for jealousy, isn't it? Try to do that now with your story. Do that with the story of what God has done, what he's brought you through, what he's taught you what you've experienced, what you've seen. Try to compare that to the person next to you. Compare that to the person that you feel so at odds with because of what they've got. And you begin to realize it's so hard to do. It's so hard to compare your story to someone else's because what my childhood was like was good and bad and so was yours. And what my job is like is different. It's good in some ways and bad. And it's so murky and it's so mysterious. And jealousy has no handhold in our lives anymore. No longer can I say this person's life is better than my own. Because stories don't do that. Stories transcend easy comparison point to point. And so you see that Thanksgiving can take deeper root because jealousy can't compete with it any longer. When we know our stories and we give thanks for our stories and we know each other's stories as well. For all of these reasons, giving thanks for our stories is so powerful. It allows us not to hide things in the closet, but to bring them front and center and say, I give thanks for you because you are part of a bigger story. And now I know God is not just this Santa Claus. He is a presence in my life. He is the one authoring all things. I understand him better theologically. And now I don't have to compare myself to anybody else in the world. I never have to compare Because my story is my own, and that other person's story is their own as well. Powerful, powerful act. The question is, how do we do that? How do we better know our stories? And I think is that we need to take more time, or less time, just counting our blessings, and more time just actually knowing our own story, knowing where we've been. What I've witnessed in evangelical church is that we rush to positivity far too fast. I don't know what it is. I don't know where it comes from. But we feel this need that when something bad or hard comes out, it's like, yeah, but what's good? Let's, let's move to something good. Let, let's praise God. And I understand the instinct behind it, but it feels rushed. It feels very fast. We just kind of rush to saying something good. And I think the laundry list understanding Thanksgiving fits very well in that mentality, in that paradigm. Because we want to rush, just write it down. How long would it take you to write some of the blessings down in your life? Two minutes, right? I could give you two minutes, and you could come up with a pretty good list of your blessings. And you could say, I feel better. Good. We did it. It's quick. It's fast. It's expedient. It's just effective. We're done. And you can move on. What if I asked you, what is your story? You can't do that in two minutes. You probably can't do that in a week. It takes a long time to discern the arcs and the curves and the valleys and the high points of your story and what God has done. And I think as Christians, being thankful for our stories means knowing our stories. It means not seeing our lives as a laundry list or an outline where we say, I've got this and I've got this and I've got that, but seeing it as a map, seeing it as a timeline that arcs and goes up and down and weaves backwards and sometimes it's like a circle or a maze. And when we see and picture our lives in that way, we begin to see other nuances of God, his wisdom and his presence, the way he forms things, the way that he redeems broken parts of our lives. But it only comes when we take the time to know our stories. I want to close just by testifying to the power of this narrative Thanksgiving, knowing your story. And that is to say, I am the last person in this room who should be talking about and preaching about being thankful in all circumstances. Because I'm terrible at it. 
I'm naturally terrible. I'm not, what is, gosh, in Winnie the Pooh? I'm not Pooh, I'm the other guy. Eeyore, I'm Eeyore, Eeyore. I am Eeyore. I am the biggest Eeyore in this room, or close to the biggest Eeyore in this room, right? When something goes wrong, I can't let it go. I cannot let it go. It gets lodged in my memory. You can talk to my wife, and she'll tell you how stuck I get in bad things, failures, disappointments, betrayals, and all the things that I've done wrong, and all the ways I've been wronged. I get very trapped in that, and I just fixate on it for a long, long time. And so as this decade comes to a close, did you guys realize the decade is coming to a close? (laughs) The 2010s are ending in a couple of months. Oh, my gosh, that's freaky. But when I think about my balance sheet in 2010, if I think about all the good and the bad things that have happened, for me, this would not be a good decade. This would be one of the decades where I'd say, I just want this to be done. I want to move 2020, tell me what you've got, because 2010, at least on paper, wasn't very good. Right? I had to, I've lost two jobs in that time period. I had to close down a church that I started. Our house has been broken into two times. Our cars, more times than I have fingers for. I've seen shootings. I've seen people bleed on streets to death in D.C. and here. My wife's been diagnosed with breast cancer twice. There's nothing good about this decade. When I list out everything that's happened, this decade is a moment for me to be rife with pessimism and depression and just everything bad. But that's not how I feel. That's not how I feel. I feel more thankful than I've ever felt in my entire life. And the reason is, is because I wrote a book. (laughs) (laughs) Nothing to do with the book. Forget about the book. What the book forced me to do is it forced me to know my story. It forced me to step away from the things that usually consume me and create blinders for me and that I get so stuck in and say, yeah, but what happened after that? What happened with your, can- with your wife's cancer? Did it stop with cancer? No, it went to healing. Yes, you had to ch- close down your church. Did your life end there? Did your story end there? But was there something else that you learned? Did you learn humility? Did you learn how not to be prideful? Did you learn that there were other plans and there were places that you had to go? My story allowed me to put all of those terribly dark and traumatic moments into a context. And now they don't just, they're not consuming me. They're just part of a tapestry. They're part of a thing where I say, yes, this was bad, but they're part of something bigger. I have never been so grateful as this decade of my life where I've experienced more hardship than ever before. Because I know my story. And everything that I've gone through is part of God's bigger story in my life. And I'm not saying this because I'm an expert of it. Please understand. I'm the worst person in this room at doing this. But this understanding of gratitude is powerful. And it's daily. And it can never be stolen from you. Your balance sheet can be stolen from you in one day. If I had you write down what was good, you get an argument with your spouse or your kids talk back to you, or you get a bill in the mail, it vanishes in a moment. It's like your lollipop, your lollipop. Whoa, what? Where did my lollipop go? If you know your story, no one can take that from you. No one can take your thanksgiving from you if you know your story. So I encourage you, this week, don't write down the good stuff. Write down all the stuff. Know what God has been doing. Know his story in your life. And give thanks for that instead. Why don't we take a moment just to do that in prayer and reflection as the worship team comes out. Let's just take a moment not just to count our blessings, but just to even ask God to inspire us and to reveal his story. The story of the good things, but also the bad things. And I think for many of us as we head into this season, Some of us are in the very worst parts of our lives. Thanksgiving feels like a very, very distant and irrelevant practice right now. But I pray that you would realize that it's not. Because you are not that moment. And God's presence in your life is not that moment either. It is something bigger and longer, more mysterious and wild than simply an enumeration of what you have. It is a story that God is weaving and writing in each one of our lives. Let's just take a moment to pray through that together. 
and then we'll close with a song of worship. Heavenly Father, we want to affirm you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. You never change like shifting shadows. But we don't want to get trapped there. We don't want to get trapped in a materialistic blessing orientation towards faith. We want to remember that, yes, you bless us. But even when we can't see those blessings, you're still here. You're still working. You are still good. This week, my prayer for myself and really for all of us Help us to know our stories. Holy Spirit, journey with us. Be with us. Take the very worst moments and make them part of something better. Reveal to us what you are doing through them. Reveal to us that our stories are not at an end because of those moments. We don't have to put them behind us and and hide them for the rest of our lives. They are part of your story. They are this broken pottery that is so beautiful because you redeem it because our pot looks nothing like someone else's. We need your help. We need your help and your Holy Spirit's wisdom and insight to do this. Holy Spirit, come. Help us to see your work, your sovereignty, your wisdom, and your love, even in the most broken places. We pray this in Jesus' name.